Good morning, Destiny. Let's try that again. Good morning, Destiny. It's good to be here. You may take your seats. Uh, I'm going to get myself situated here. It's good to be here with you guys. I am uh, here at my first ever Destiny, or uh, the gathering, if you would. And I know many of you don't know me, so I'm going to take a few moments just to let you know who I am. Well, listen, I am your Puerto Rican, Amish <laughs> cousin from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. <laughs> No, I'm not really Amish. Please don't ask me about the Amish people, right? Good people. Uh, but I am, uh, I am, my parents come from Puerto Rico, but I have been born and raised in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, right in the center of Amish country. And um, that's a little bit about me. I am six foot six. <laughs> Let's just deal with all the problems before we get started with this message, all right? Six foot six. No, I am married to the just the, the prettiest thing on this side of heaven, Tammy, and I just love her so much, and she's here with me, and we are the parents of five boys. I think y'all got a picture. I think there's a picture. There they are. There's the crew there. And um, there are five because we were looking for a girl. We're trying for a girl, and we just kept having boys. And um, so they rage in age from 14 to 1. Please pray for us. Um, so you've got AJ and we have Caleb and Chase and Jackson and Micah and Micah's new nickname is Omega. There's another bus coming in three minutes. Jump on that bus. He is, he's, it's it. It's finished. It's over. My wife and I uh, are glad to be here. We decided, uh, since we were coming to Louisiana that we would fly into, and I'm going to say it like y'all say it down here, New Orleans. Is that how y'all say it? New Orleans, New Orleans. Okay. We went down there and hung out for a little bit. And I just want to settle this. Um, they have these things called French donuts or something like that. Beignets. Beignets. Um, let me just let the, I'm going to set the record straight. They are nothing more than glorified funnel cakes from the carnival. I just want to let you know that. <laughs> My wife, <laughs> I knew that would strike a nerve. I knew it. So. So my wife and I stood in this line in the heat. And we stood in this line because we had to do the tourist thing, right? And I'm standing in the line, and we get that little bag. And I bite into that bag. I said, babe, this is a, this is a funnel cake. We could have got this back home. <laughs> All right. A tough crowd, tough crowd. A lot of folks from this area, huh? <laughs> Listen, uh, I, I'm excited to be with you. I, I would... Be not telling you the truth if I was a little, if I didn't say I was a little nervous. Uh, we're just getting to know each other, and I'm going to get up here and start yelling at you. Uh, not literally. Uh, but I, I am so grateful for the opportunity, and I can't go without honoring Dr. Brassfield and just, just for being who he is, for being the encourager and the champion. And I just thank you. I thank you for the past two years. He has uh, helped walk me through some challenging moments and seasons in ministry and life. And it's people like you that make ministry just uh, just an easier thing to do, I should say, time to time. So I just thank you. And Kathy, thank you so much for your love and support as well. And just for everybody. Well, let's, let's get into this. Um, uh, my wife said, be yourself. How many know you need to listen to your wife a lot? Like, come on, husbands, right? Like, like 99.9% like of the time. It works, right? She said, be yourself. So I'm going to be myself this morning. And uh, I, want, I want to talk to you uh, uh, from, this mess, from this topic, if you would, and that is, you were built for this. You were built for this. Would you go with me to the book of Nehemiah, the fourth chapter? Read from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 4, from verses 15 to verse number 20. And here's how it reads. It says, when our enemies heard that we were, that we were aware of their plot, and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. 
And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out. We are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear or wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Now let's read this last part with faith. Our God will fight for us. Let's try that one more time till you get it in your spirit. Say, our God will fight for us. Now give God 10 seconds of your best praise and worship because you know he can. The book of Nehemiah is an incredible narrative from which we draw many different leadership lessons. From Nehemiah's organizational structure to his strategy for completing the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. And as a church leader, more than likely, you've heard a whole lot of leadership lessons from the book of Nehemiah. So this, this morning, I don't think I will be sharing anything with you that is brand new. But I would ask for you, for just a few moments, if you would, if we would together, let's take a deeper look into the story before the story. Uh, let's take a deeper look into the moment before the moment. Nehemiah chapter 1 ends with five words that gives us a picture into the story before the story. Here's how it ends with five words. Or rather, it's six words. I was the cupbearer to the king. I was the cupbearer to the king. And it is from those words right there we get a picture of Nehemiah's, Nehemiah's training or his development. You see, before Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, he was serving as a cupbearer to the Persian king. Historically, a cupbearer was a high-ranking official in charge of serving the king's court. It was primarily the responsibility of the, of the cupbearer to serve the, the, the wine at the royal table. And since kings were always concerned about plots uh, to poison them and to kill them, the cupbearer had the responsibility of often tasting the drink before it came. Now, due to the responsibilities uh, of the position, a cupbearer had to be a trustworthy and loyal person, someone to whom the king could, could, could trust with his, his life. Now, I want you to see this long before news of Jerusalem's ruins had gotten to Nehemiah, God had strategically positioned him for a time of preparation. Nehemiah's position as the cupbearer uh, would have put him close enough to the king's table where he would have been able to hear some conversations about city planning. He would have been able to garner some strategies on how to fortify a city. You see, God had put him in a place that may have looked like exile to others, but was actually a place of preparation for him. Y'all with me? Uh, <laughs> I, I, and I was considering that. I said, God, there are so many times that you go before us. We love to, to preach that text, right? We know that God goes before us. And oftentimes, God, go before, go, God going before us is him strategically positioning us in places where he can develop us for where he's about to take us. Uh, and it goes back to the thought that I shared with you a few moments ago. You were built for this. You were built for this. Uh, I, um, I, there was, it was the middle of this, this lockdown, this pandemic thing, and, and I went to the place where the saints meet. I went to the place where God's people go when the church is closed. I went to Walmart. <laughs> Am I at the right church? The saints meet at Walmart. The people of God... <laughs> I don't know what, I don't know where y'all at with Walmart. Some people don't like it, but praise be to God for Walmart. Uh, and I was walking through Walmart, and this was uh, it, right in the middle of everything. And our area had gotten hard hit. We have a lot of uh, retirement communities and, and homes for the elderly. And, and it just started spreading everywhere, and everything was locked down. And I was there, and it was about the time where everyone looked like an astronaut on their way to an Apollo mission. 
You know, I'm talking about the early part. I don't know if it happened down here in the South, but folks would be all wrapped up. I mean, masks and goggles and a face shield and gloves, and they were walking into the stores like this. And I'm walking in the Walmart because I showed you the picture of five boys. They eat everything. And I was on a mission at Walmart to get as many Hot Pockets as I could get. I'm sorry, I feed my kids Hot Pockets. Let me find as many frozen pizzas and Hot Pockets so we can make it through this thing. And I'm going through the aisles at Walmart and I run into an old sanctified church mother. Some of you might not know what that means. So let me define it for you. It's one of those church people that will catch the Holy Ghost wherever they are. Am I at the right place? Don't care if you're at Walmart in aisle 13, right next to the paper towels. They will cut a step and start speaking in other tongues. Her name is Sister Judy McLeod friend of my mother's and, and we have known her for years and she is a prayer warrior. She is the kind of person when you get around them, you know they've been with God. And I see Sister Judy in the aisle at Walmart and I say, hey, Sister Judy, how are you doing? But I said, what are you doing here? We could have came and got this stuff for you. And she's looked at me and she says, we're going to be all right. And I said, you are right. And then she looked at me and she says, you know what? Some of the saints are losing their minds. They refer to church people as the saints. I'm just trying. Some are like, why are we calling the saints? They said, the saints are losing their mind. And then she looked at me. And she did what sanctified people do. And they get ready to tell you something real good. She pulled up her sanctified finger. Am I talking to anybody? She looked at me like this and she said, we were built for this. <laughs> and then she walked away from me. Just walked away. Just walked away and had a Holy Ghost fit right there. And those words have stuck with me every step of the way. These past 15 months, we were built for this. There is a story before the story. So I chased Sister Judy down and we began to talk about it with a little more detail. And I said, what do you mean? She said, do you remember those prayer services back in 2002 and 2003? I said, yes, I do. I was in college and we would be in those, those we were in the storefront church and we would be right on those old metal chairs and we had those prayer pillows. And she said, yeah, you remember when we would be down in prayer? He says, God was building you for this moment. And she says, you remember three years ago when you were preaching this and you were preaching that? God was building you for the moment. Do you remember when you went through that sickness? Do you remember when your family member passed away? Do you remember all those moments where the faithfulness of God was being tested in your life? She said, you were built for this moment. I just came to tell destiny you were built for this moment. <laughs> oh, I feel my help coming now. I feel the Holy Ghost now. You were built for this moment. This is not the time to cower. This is not the time to turn away. This is not the time to run. You were built for this moment. And he was preparing you in the positioning. He positioned you in places where your feelings were hurt. God help me. He positioned you in places where, where you had to go through emotional pain and trauma. You had to go through betrayal because like Bishop Joseph Garlington says, he says, you can't do ministry without betrayal. You had to have somebody walk out on you. You had to go through the pain and the tears of loss. But let me tell you this. He was building you for this moment right here. You were built. You were built for this. Get back to your notes, son. You see, Nehemiah's service to the king of Persia was preparing him for service to the king of kings. See, he was serving in an enemy land, if you would, but he was preparing, being prepared to serve his king. Uh, God was preparing Nehemiah for the moment he was being built up and equipped to do the great work that would be required of him in Jerusalem. Now, I want you to, to see this. Uh, Robert Schuller said this. He said, spectacular achievement is always preceded by unspect uh, unspectacular preparation. See, the preparation doesn't always feel so right. 
The preparation, uh, preparation is average. Preparation is mundane. Preparation is everyday life. Preparation is taking care of five boys and dealing with all of their attitudes. Dealing with all of the, the unique personalities that they have. Preparation is, is, is in the little, the, just the minute details of life. And because it doesn't feel spectacular, it's easy for us to want to run away from it. It's easy for us to step away from it when, we, when, when it doesn't feel like we're casting a great vision, but we're just kind of living and working things out every single day. But before you get to these spectacular moments in life, there is this season of just the, the regular hustle, bustle every single day. Now, I want you to, I, I want to uh, just kind of build this thought. Uh, not only do I believe that we were built for this, but because we were built for this, I believe that God is calling us to build it back better. Now, maybe your church, your ministry, your nonprofit organization, whatever it is that God has given you uh, the, the responsibility to lead has not been impacted by the past 15 years. But, but if you're like the rest of us, we have seen some things lost during this season. We, we have had to make, uh, and I, I, I just want to eliminate these words from my vocabulary, the word pivot. I can't stand that word anymore. Please don't use the word pivot. Don't use the word zoom around me. I'm allergic to pivots and Zoom. Okay, leaders, we've been using that word, those words way too much. But for the last 15 months, there's been changes, and there are still changes as we're getting our churches back into the flow of life again. There, there, there have been some things that we've had to wrestle through, and I've had to look at some things, and I had to be honest with myself and say, this next time, I'm going to build it back better. See, if, if I'm talking to some real leaders in the room, you'll have to acknowledge that some of what you built probably wasn't built the right way. It's just me. It's just me. It's not you. It's just in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where the Amish are. It's probably because of that. But I realized that there were some things that we were building that weren't built God's way. And I had to acknowledge that. And what I'm saying is that going forward, I realized, hey, that wasn't built God's way. But, the, but let, let the devil know this. Let every enemy that's speaking against God's church know this. That not only were we built for this moment, but we're going to build this thing back better. I wish I had a few more pastors, church leaders out there. Come on, the enemy's been speaking all kinds of lies over you and your ministry, but you make that declaration today. I was built for this moment, and I'm about to re I'm gonna rebuild this thing better. It's going to be better than it's ever been before. The church will be stronger than it ever was before. The volunteer team will be stronger than it ever was before. Before. Jesus, help me. You were built for this. It's been hard, but you were built for this. Now, we can easily kind of mask some of the emotional trauma we experience with a whole bunch of hooping and hollering like church folks do. But the truth is there's some trauma associated to what we just experienced. We are grieving the loss of things that we thought were permanent. I'm not, I'm not talking about our schedules. I'm talking about people we loved. And there's a grieving that we are experiencing right now that we're walking through. And, and here's the challenge is we're grieving and building at the same time. And not only are we grieving, but we're fighting the culture. The world around us is at odds with the church. So we find ourselves just like Nehemiah and the people that are rebuilding the walls of the city. If you go through that long story through, through chapter number four, you'll, you'll hear they began to build the wall. And when they got the wall about halfway up, they noticed there were some enemies. And they're trying to build, and while they're trying to build, someone's trying to break everything down. So we're building, we're grieving, and we're fighting. Now you know why you're tired. Come on, somebody. That's why you went back to the hotel and went to sleep at 8 o'clock last night. Every pastor I said, what'd you do? Nothing. Because <laughs> we've been working. And not just working externally, but internally so much more. 
sorting through all the emotions of leading people you love and now not leading them. I mean, that's what pastoring is, is it not? It's shepherding. It's, it's loving people through various seasons of their life. And then they just up and ghost you. <laughs> I'm at the right conference. I know it. <laughs> it's just not even a phone call. And you, you, <laughs> you're laying in bed praying for their family. All that grieving. That's grieving, y'all. We're grieving, we're building, and we're fighting. And it seems like it's an impossible task. There's no way we're going to be able to do this. And the Bible says, as you read through Nehemiah chapter 4, that he tells them, hey, guys, we're going to keep building, but you're going to have to pick up a sword too. And I'm bringing this to light because I think we think that we're the only people that have ever had to do this. Well, there's this whole biblical narrative that tells us that there will be times that you're going to have to fight and build at the same time. There will be times where you're going to have to literally carry a sword in one hand, and in the other hand, you're going to have to lay the foundation for whatever it is that's coming next in your ministry. And you're going to have to be dealing with the internal trauma. You're going to be dealing with all the pain associated with all that we've been through all at the same time. And I want to tell you this, that if God brought you to it, he's going to take you through that thing. I believe that. I believe that. I think that sometimes as leaders, we will minister to people and miss the lessons we are sharing with everybody else. I mean, we will preach it with such deep conviction and clarity as it looks that way, I should say. And the people will leave the church blessed and we'll leave the church empty. But I want to say today to every leader, as I'm saying to myself, you were built for this moment and you're going to rebuild everything better than it was before. Come on, give God 10 seconds of your best praise. Well, there's a few things to consider as we prepare our hearts and our minds to begin to build back better. And I want to just bring these three thoughts to you real quickly. Number one is this, that you got to understand that rebuilding is going to attract new enemies. Nehemiah 4 and 1 tells that from the, from the onset of chapter 4, it says, they started building the wall and somebody heard, Sambalot heard. Whoever names their child Sambalot needs to talk to Jesus. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm playing with y'all. I want to make sure you're still alive. All they were doing was rebuilding something that was already existent and the world was going crazy. The church has always been the church. And don't you see that the enemy coming after us in a way that we have not seen in a very long time? And it's because we're taking back and rebuilding something that will bring honor and glory to God. So it's important for us to keep that in our mind as we begin the process of building the ministry back. As you start trying to build the volunteer base back. As you start trying to reposition people in your church and in your organization so they can help lead your church into the future. There's going to be somebody with an attitude. There's always somebody at church with an attitude. And is it only in Lancaster again? I'm moving here. This is the perfect place to live. <laughs> there, an enemy is going to appear out of nowhere and start coming against you. And here's the, 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 the greatest challenge is to not be distracted from the work you've been called to. I have found more in this season that, I, that any time I am off course, it is because I am allowing something that was only meant to distract me to take my time and energy away from the thing that God has put in front of me. I can't spend my day worrying about everybody who ghosted me. I have to consider all the people that God has left in my care to love and to to disciple and to rear and to develop. Come on, church leader. We got to take what God, listen, there's always a remnant. There's always a people within a people. And if you will take the little bit that God left you, I'm telling you, he'll work a miracle out of the little bit. He'll work a miracle out of the crumbs. So, so be careful to not allow the enemy to distract you from the work. Just know that you are building in the presence of enemies. So get your sword ready. 
Here, here's the next thought you, you got to consider as you look to build back better. And that's this. Building and fighting go hand in hand. Anytime you attempt to build something in the name of the Lord, expect a fight. And expect to build and fight at the same time. Several years ago, we were in the middle of a revival. We had baptized 175 brand new converts. God was moving and it was incredible. We were doing church in a movie theater. It was me at like 10, Fast and the Furious at like 11.30. <laughs> and it was working great. I mean, the revival. God was moving in a powerful way. And then the movie theater decides they want to remodel. And they want to put those big old reclining seats in. So they were going to cut our seating capacity in half. And it wasn't going to work. And we were homeless. Nowhere to go. Nowhere. To, I mean, just to have anywhere to go as a church. And I'm watching a, a, a Christian play production. Some of you may be familiar with it. Sight and Sound. They have one in Branson, Missouri. They have one in Lancaster's where it all started. And and we were there at the show in Lancaster, and one of my friends who's a pastor's daughter was one of the uh, uh, play, players in the, in, in the production. And I was there, and I walked in and looked around and said, we can do church in here. And his wife casually said, hey, you know their original building down the street? It's available. And we made a phone call and made some connections and got to connect it with a man by the name of, uh, of, of Glenn Eshelman, who's the founder and creator of Sight and Sound. And a week later, we were standing on the stage of the original building where this whole thing started. And we were there saying, can we use this as a church? And he walked up to my wife and I. This is how God does it. Walked up to my wife and I, and he says, where's the pastor at? And I said, that's me right here. <laughs> and the truth be said, I thought, I didn't think he was the owner because he was so casual. I thought that this, the owner would have been some glamorous type, and he came in, and he was so casual. He says, I've got a word from the Lord for you. And he said, where's your wife? And I said, she's over there, but. <laughs> and he said this. He looked at my wife, and he says, you've been asking God, when is it going to get better? When is it going to feel easy? And I got an answer for you. It's not. Am I, and here's the thing. Nobody knew that we were with our elders. They didn't know what we had been talking about. My wife had been saying, when is this going to get easier? When are we going to be able to breathe? Because the weight, some of y'all know what I'm talking about, the weight of the ministry, the weight of leading God's people was so much. And he looked at her and he says, it's not going to feel easier. It's not going to get lighter. But God's going to put a grace on you. And you're going to learn how to battle through that thing every single day. And you're going to learn that, yes, 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 if you're going to build God's kingdom, there's always going to be warfare. There's always going to be fighting. And, yes, it's always going to feel a little pressure, but you're going to know this, that greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Are you hearing me, somebody? There's a... Get there's a grace that God has put on you and me so that we would be able to build and fight at the same time. You have the grace in you. And here, here's, here's the last one. Here's the last one. And I want you to see this, Destiny. And I've learned this one. It's personal to me this past year. Because this network, whether we have been able to meet in person or not, this network has blessed my life. This network has helped carry me through this season, having people to bounce thoughts and ideas off and being able to have people to speak into my life has blessed me. I want you to get this last point. If you're going to build it back better, we must build together. What do you mean? Well, Nehemiah 4, 19, verse 20 says this. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us. Where? There. And I love that last part. Our God will fight for us. You see, rebuilding the church is not going to be a one church gig. 
I need somebody to hear me now. Rebuilding the church is not going to be a Christ church thing or an oasis thing or a journey thing. Rebuilding the church is going to be a kingdom thing. Everybody got to get in on the party. I need somebody to hear me now. This is my preach. I'm almost done. You see, the battle, the battle that we're fighting is an enemy that is stretched wide. And they're going to attack us from every side. But Nehemiah had a system. He had a man that would walk around with him with a trumpet. And every time the enemy would come in, they would blow the sound of the trumpet. And everybody would run to that area and say, come on, devil, give us your best shot. I wish I had somebody in this room today that understand we're better together than we are apart. You need me and I need you. I need you to hear me. Louisiana and Pennsylvania, black and white, Hispanic, Asian, and everything in between. The kingdom of God needs to come together. There's only one way to build it back, and it's together. Psalms 133, there is a blessing commanded upon the unity of the brethren. It comes on our unity. And the attack on our unity has been crazy these last few weeks and months whether it be politics or issues of race or whether it just be preferences but I still believe in the church I am body positive that's a new social movement that says it don't matter how big you are you better own it If you, if you got a six pack or that joke is unpacked, be you, boo. <laughs> Enjoy who you are. That's that move. I don't know all the ins and outs. Please don't give me a lesson on it. But if the world can be positive about everything that's not right, if the world can be positive about all the evil things that are going on out there, I'm going to be positive about the body of Christ. I love the body of Christ. I love the body of Christ. I love it when it's bloody. I love it when it's broken. I love it. I love it like Mary Magdalene and Mary and Salome loved it. They, want, they loved the body of Christ so much that they went and they were going to put precious ointments on his broken, bloody body. You and I, we're the body. and We've been broken and we've been bloody but I love the body of Christ. Destiny, you were built for this. <laughs> and now that you know you were built for this, I'm gonna end with this. Let's build this thing back better together. Thank you, God bless you.